What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network and is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, my guest is Daniel Hazen. Daniel is a psychiatric survivor. He's a survivor of the prison system, and he's the executive director of Voices of the Heart, which is a fantastic and very successful peer-run agency in Queensbury, New York. And he's one of the founding board members of the Center for the Human Rights of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry. And we're speaking today about prisons, the mental health system, and human rights. Daniel, thank you for joining us today on Madness Radio. Thank you, Will. Daniel, I want to really congratulate you I want to, for your work with Voices of the Heart, which is a, just an incredibly successful and very powerful and innovative peer-run agency. I've had the opportunity to visit Voices of the Heart and get to know some of the folks there and do some work with you out there in uh, Queensbury, New York. And I just want to congratulate you for all the great work that you're doing. We appreciate that here. And I do want to acknowledge that it's a great opportunity for me to be working here at Voices of the Heart and the crew, as we like to call ourselves here, and the uh, amazing work that we're pushing forward in our local community. So thank you. Today we're going to be focusing on the prison system, and I should encourage people to um, also check out the interview I did with Terry Cooper's author of Prison Madness, and that's archived at the Madness Radio website. And Daniel, I wanted to have you on the show because of your advocacy work around prisons. You were recently at the um, Occupy San Quentin protest in February that Occupy Oakland and the organization All of Us or None organized at the San Quentin prison in California. You were one of the main speakers there as part of the Occupy movement. And you yourself are a survivor of the prison system as well as someone who's been a psychiatric diagnosed and a survivor of the psychiatric system. Maybe we should get started. Just tell us some your own story. How was it that you ended up both as a mental health patient and also someone who was in the prison system. My uh, first run-in with uh, the mental health system was entered the psychiatric system at age 15 through being uh, institutionalized uh, for a period of time after a uh, unfortunate suicide death of a very good friend of mine. And from there, after the traumatizing experience, I was unable to escape the system for until my early 30s. So in between the 15 years of age and 30 years of age, I experienced different experiences of being locked up in state psychiatric institutions, court hearings, keeping me uh, under retention, sort of this in and out of the system as a young person, then into adulthood. So this started Um, when you were 15 and then continued for 15 years. That's correct. It finally, which is an odd statement to make, but I do make this statement, I actually escaped what I call psychiatry through actually being in the prison system. My prison system experience was an awakening experience in in several different ways, but one mostly around oppression and uh, discrimination. Being a white male prisoner uh, opened my eyes to much that was uh, going on in our communities, especially in the prison industry, but also afforded me the opportunity to come off psychiatric drugs slash medications while I was confined in the prison system. So the prison system was really a big turning point for your political awareness and also kind of getting you out of that psychiatric identity, it sounds like. And and Daniel, you said that the trauma when you um, your friend committed suicide when you were age 15, was this another teenager who was a friend of yours? That's correct, yeah. He, he was uh, a year older than I was, um, but we were very, you know, close, obviously. Spent a lot of time together. Really, what was going on was, you know, this ta- taboo subject to talk about suicide um, and the feelings of suicide. And I think the fear of people in our community and family members to, to feel that the attempt was going to be taking place. So, you know, my introduction was basically a restraint and seclusion room in the state psychiatric facility on the Canadian border of Uh, St. Lawrence uh, County. Were you having a lot of distress? Were you just completely upset and traumatized by what happened? I can only I can only imagine their their state when one of your close friends commits suicide at age 15. Well what I do know is is that you know there was all these questions um, and then this this feeling of loss and not understanding and wanting to be able to express that and talk about it whereas you know uh, this many years ago let alone today it's it's the same scenario um, it's a taboo subject to talk about I think it 
it ignited some very deep-rooted feelings past things that had taken place in my life as well. So, there, you know, there was this, the re-traumatization really came from being secluded and being seen as an object once I got to that institution and then not listening to really what had taken place and why I had felt some of the feelings that I was feeling. Um, and their only answer was, stay here longer. You're suicidal. You know, you need to, to work on yourself and not really get connected to the real deep issue of our good friend leaving this world. So oh, it's, a painful, it's a painful story. I mean, as a, as a teenager, you really needed someone to talk to and help you through these feelings that you were having. It sounds like you became suicidal. And then that was what triggered the reaction of locking you up, putting you in seclusion, getting you institutionalized. And that was the beginning of a whole 15 year journey in the system. Right, exactly. The system just basically wanted to constantly not ever talk about those issues, but wanted to constantly put their subjective and objective thoughts upon me as a young person. And, you know, as a young skateboard punk, people telling you who you are and <laughs> what you should be didn't go over well. And I experienced that, the re-traumatization, and especially the forced drugging through those years really inflamed some more intensity in my life. Uh, you know, I began to hear voices and, you know, experience forms of things what I call, you know, madness, me running around the country hitchhiking, just some different various things that people seem to uh, label as, you know, extreme states or madness. And every time uh, I ventured on one of these experiences, people's only answer was the institution, psychiatry, psychiatric drugs, medications, things just didn't work. And later, I actually experienced owning a business and that business I closed after not being successful, and there were some criminal charges that were brought against me around uh, forgery and grand larceny. I will say that my family is pretty well known in, in the community um, as business owners, and they wanted to prosecute me for these these crimes. What I experienced then was the penal system, um, and I'm not sure many people know this, but at least in New York State, the penal system is, if you're in the state psychiatric system, and you come into the penal system, they know that you have psychiatric labels, you've been in the psychiatric institution. There's no privacy at all, they just transfer right. right over, yeah. So the discrimination of the label was was there ever open. What happened was, uh, the moment I entered the penal system, their first answer was that I needed to go to a separate part of the prison where people uh, with psychiatric labels um, were to be held until um, seen by uh, a mental health professional inside the prison system. And that led me to um, being put in solitary confinement until that person therefore saw me. So as soon as you arrived in the prison system with your history, they put you in solitary confinement just because you had a mental health diagnosis. Yep, in solitary confinement and a separate part of the prison. So basically, you know, you were known as crazy and uh, all the names that come with it in the penal system. Um, and then you're confined, you know, no showers, same kind of feed you through the, um, you know, the slot kind of system. How long did you have to wait until you actually saw a mental health professional? I saw a mental, mental health professional about uh, six days later, which was an interview process which is a great lead into how the system works inside the prison system is, is there's actually a psychiatric hospital, quote unquote hospital, inside the prison system where I was shipped off to to be further evaluated or uh, therefore then um, forced to see a judge to see if medication was um, what their answer was going to be for me. You know, there's a system inside the prison system where mental health is quite oppressive with people who are experiencing different you know mental health experiences trauma um, and then there is still the issue of forced drugging and solitary confinement inside these hospitals inside prisons which sounds like a lot of inside <laughs> uh, that's what happens so I experienced that if you don't comply if you can imagine being a convicted felon um, inside a prison system and then having the mental patient status, your chances of representing yourself before any of these systems is uh, pretty short. So the treatment that you were offered once you were in the prison system really was just about, um, we're going to evaluate you, coerce you, and decide whether or not to force you on medications, whether you want it or not. It's not about counseling. It's not about actually working with you to collaborate with you therapeutically. It's more about evaluating control and then imposing a treatment on you. Oh, they have their specific processes. Yeah, they they certainly want to um they want to reinforce the label. It's interesting because I didn't want to take psychiatric drugs 
I wasn't on psychiatric drugs coming into the, the prison system, but their answer for me was to be on them based on the history of what they had seen up to this point. So when, then, when I refused that process and asked to be sent to general population, I was sent from downstate to um, central New York, a psychiatric penal system. Uh, that's their process. It's a special hub. Basically, the experience is if you can go before the court and have your attorney attempt to represent you, but, you know, it's about a minute process. The judge basically deems you, you know, as I said earlier, not only are you a mental patient, but you're also, a, you know, a, a convicted felon. So your rights there are pretty much shot. And uh, what I experienced then was sent back to the psychiatric, quote unquote, hospital in the prison system where I had to comply with what they felt was, you know, the treatment regimen for me before I could go back to general population. And then once I complied to their level, I moved to general population where there I began to come off actual psychiatric drugs because how they do that in the system is they have a call out certain times of the day and they actually call this Skittle Row and I'll refer to what that means in a bit. But you would walk, march to the uh, the medical place where you'd pick up your medications for various things, not just for psychiatric issues. You would see people walking back and, you know, this is like cows herding to the trough. It was just disgusting. But you would see people show up. And one thing I learned immediately was that I could wean myself off Depakote, Zyprexa, and, and Celexa by uh, beginning the process of, of just mouthing them, hiding them, and then spitting them out. How I learned that was from my peers inside the prison system were doing the same thing. And what happened was I noticed that on the ground, this was wintertime, was there was tons of colors in the snow. And in the snow was pills that people were spitting out and, and tossing aside because people, obviously, I wasn't alone. That The toxicity of particular medications slash drugs were affecting people. So this is widespread. There were many, many prisoners who were forced onto medications and then figuring out ways to resist that. And Daniel, I have to say, I mean, of all the people that I've worked with um, and talked to and learned about in terms of their coming off medications experience, I've never heard a story quite like the story you just told about how you came off psychiatric drugs. It was a process and I had no no support really as far as educational information and resources. What I knew was is that, you know, from my life experience of 15 on up is that, you know, I've had toxicity poison and that it could be dangerous. And I, I felt that you know, weaning myself off was the best process for me. And obviously, I didn't just um, come off these cold turkey. This was a process for me to slowly take some sometimes and, and ditch some other times, if that makes sense. Wow, incredible stories. Daniel, are there any other stories that you want to tell about being in either the psych system or the prison system before we move on to some of the broader policy issues? I should mention this one form of um, what I called still today peer support. I get a little emotional, but a good friend of mine who was at that point not in solitary confinement, but is today, who I believe is a close friend of mine, a peer who really supported me being locked up in, in the prison system. You know, he was part of my awakening, I should say. You know, I talk about all these brief scenarios of experiences. I, I think one of the most powerful experiences that I had was uh, walking around the prison yard. And I have to tell you, I, it was pretty fearful to to walk into a prison yard when I first entered the, the prison system of all the things you see on TV and all the things you hear on, you know, the news. It must have been, it must have been terrifying. I mean, the, just the rape situation is so extreme and so much fear about being raped in prison. I can't even, can't even imagine how horrifying it must have been to arrive as a, you know, relatively young man in a situation. And you're not a big guy, Daniel. I know you. You're not like this big, tough <laughs> guy. You're like about my size. So it must have been really scary. At first, it was just a complete, you know, shock to me, just the whole system. And I was very fearful. I, I would never say I wasn't. And then I began to see this camaraderie of people and humanity. And, you know, that was my awakening experience. And I, I met this, I call him a young man, but he really wasn't a young man. We're the same age, but and his, his nickname inside the prison system was Junebug. And um, we would just walk around the yard and we would talk about oppression and I think what's the most amazing thing, and this is public knowledge, is, is that he was a convicted murder, uh, murderer, and he was a person who I found most supportive in, in what I was explaining uh, with my experience, uh, right down to the psychiatric oppression that I was experiencing. And when we talk about peer support in our movement, I think it was one of the most powerful experiences that I could find inside the prison system. And actually, he was very supportive in my weaning off process. We would talk about that with long walks around the uh, the wire fence, the barbed wire fence, should I say, 
and uh, we would talk about other things of why we were here and what is the prison industry and why is uh, the majority of people behind these bars people of color or uh, of uh, the Latino community and it was just a human rights awakening moment for me where I think I shed any labels and just decided at that point that when I left this place that I would fight any forms of oppression and I have to admit that I should mention this part of the story is is that I really believe I, the reason why I'm free today is um, I don't know if I've talked about this much was I had won my appeal and I, I think the appeal came because I was a white privileged uh, man and, and as well as I had very good family support to move towards me getting a pro bono lawyer to fight for the injustice that I experienced. But I had a guilty feeling leaving the prison system because I knew so many of my brothers that were behind the wall would never experience that kind of, I guess, uh, luck that I had. I like to talk about that in general wherever I, I talk about prison and psychiatric crossings is that, you know, the, the dis racial disparities that are behind these walls is just incredible. And uh, we see this in psychiatry as well as, as with involuntary outpatient commitment laws in New York State. You know, you're five times more likely to be put on involuntary outpatient commitment laws. And as a person of color, you're five times more likely to be forced yep. force treated in New York than than a white person is. And that's a very important thing to look at. If the penal system is is comprised of this majority of people inside the prison uh, industry. And the segue is is that many people with parole have to agree to particular uh, regulations under parole. And some of those sometimes are forced uh, mental health treatment. And that you're looking at a, a correlation here is, is that the majority of people in prison are people of color. And then the majority of people have involuntary outpatient commitment laws. And I think we have to look at how many of those people are coming and being forced into uh, the mental health system, which is just a giant reciprocal cycle of oppression if we look at this. I want to make a point that I don't speak for um, the black liberation community. It's just something I experienced being inside the penal system and seeing this discrimination that was right before my eyes. Well, the situation with the criminal justice system in general in the United States, it's just absolutely appalling. I mean, in a lot of ways, it really is just a continuation of the brutality and the racism of the plantation system in the South. And uh, black men are seven times more likely to be incarcerated than, than white men in the United States. And there's um, policing and harassment that happens in the communities. There's the incarceration. And then there's the losing of rights as a convicted felon when you come out of the system you basically become a second-class citizen. You can't vote. You're not eligible for different kinds of public um, assistance programs. And so we have an incredibly brutal and discriminatory prison justice system in general. And then the story of mental health within that system just adds a whole other level of abuse and mistreatment. And uh, we, we lock up more people in the United States than any other country in the world. The extensive use of solitary confinement in the prisons and the way in which, as you said, it's really white privilege and class privilege that says who goes in and who doesn't go go in, who's able to stay out of the system. It's it's the plea bargaining. I think something like seventy or eighty percent of uh, of convictions in terms of felonies are settled through a plea bargain. They don't even go to trial. It's very politic. It's very much about the quality of the lawyer and legal representation that you can get and the discrimination of the system in terms of your of your color and your background. So we're talking about a situation that's really driven in, in large part by racism and the way in which the, the war on drugs is so discriminatory. I mean, the, the drug arrests are primarily targeted against people of color. It may be that the drug use in the country, country as a whole, the majority of the people who use drugs, illegal drugs, are white. The majority of the people who use illegal drugs are middle class. But because without that class privilege, it ends up being a street market in certain communities, and then that's when the police pick it up, and that's when the peop the police target those communities. And so we're also seeing this whole issue is being driven by the privatization of the prison system, where basically the more prisoners you have, the more business it is for the private prison companies, because so many states are now contracting out to private prison companies. So we have a basically an a absolute disaster. It's a disgrace. It's a moral, a moral offense to humanity of what's happening with the prison system in the United States. And that's why I think it's so important, the work that, that you're doing, Daniel, because you bring together all these different issues. Any other stories you'd like to share about your prison experience and what that was like for you? Or sounds like you, you're really, that's when your awakening happened and you became committed 
to being an anti-oppression activist? I spent three years in prison, and I, I think the initial experience of you know these first six to twelve months of being shuffled around with the prison system and the psychiatric system and being in solitary confinement for periods of the times or being sent to the psychiatric institution. Those, I call them the, the infancy of and the beginning of, of coming into the penal system, the, the re-traumatization of when you come into the system, the prison system, how we, I shouldn't say we, how they, you know, use this process of uh, stripping you of your humanity and, and giving you a number you know, I still remember mine, O2R6000. I never will forget that number. And stripping you of your name, stripping you of your hair, having you walk through this line where the powder is being dropped onto you and delicing you. I think it's important to, to use what really happened, and, and this may be graphic for some people, but to be told to bend over. And a person who's experienced, you know, sexual abuse, and, and I have to think in, in this country, it's a lot of us, the re-traumatization that comes from that and the heckling and, and the stuff that I experienced at the prison guards and that entry of that system just so much reminded me of what I have seen in times of the Holocaust and, you know, torture um, and the element of it. And I think mm -hmm. uh, there just has to be a complete abolition of, of this kind of treatment to, to human beings. And uh, I mean, I was chained to people who were people who even shared with me that they had murdered people. And I have to tell you, my fear level was not, you know, panic and run. I mean, I guess the reality is I wasn't going very far chained. But the reality was, is that we were human beings in this system. We shouldn't, nobody deserves to be treated and tortured in those kind of practices and ways. And so... Some of my stuff is to go deeper in uh, the process of, one, I, I think these institutions should be shut down, but the practice, what would a different system look like? And um, I want to say this as well as I want to remind people that women, which is actually the fastest growing, excuse the expression, segment uh, experience this as well, which is the fastest growing people to be uh, put in prison now is, is women. Prisons are growing fast um, as an industry. So... If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio, and my guest today is Daniel Hazen. Uh, he's a psychiatric survivor, a survivor of the prison system, and the executive director of the peer-run agency Voices of the Heart. And we're speaking with Daniel today about prisons, mental health, and psychiatric human rights. Many of them are mothers, and the way in which being separated from your children is so devastating for future generations and so, so painful. To the women who are incarcerated. I've had the um, great experience of having conversations and organizing with meeting some powerful women, sharing their experiences and, and learning um, actually the commonalities and obviously some differences. But uh, I always like to make sure that we're talking about our brothers and sisters who are experiencing the same things. You know, a trauma is a, a big discussion and dialogue and one the movement um, in general and, and the calling for alternatives to this traditional mental health system or abuse and torture itself, I think we have to really create some uh, new ways uh, in which how we're doing things in our society because they're just demeaning and continue the, the traumatization, the pain, and the hurt for people. Well, you mentioned something really important, which was how you were able to get peer support, even from someone who our, our first kind of stereotypical reaction would be, oh, he's a murderer. What kind of supportive person can and he be? And I have to say, one of the facilitators um, of our Portland Hearing Voices group, you know, has a history of violence and voices and in the system, and he's open about that and he talks about that, and he's a wonderful, wonderful supportive facilitator. In fact, we need people like him. The uh, importance of peer support among former prisoners that there have been some programs, some innovative programs and research showing that it makes sense that if you have been incarcerated, you've been through that experience, you have your own story that can connect you with other people who have that similar story and creating peer networks of former prisoners to help each other re-enter the community, reintegrate into the community, understand what it takes to navigate the incredibly complicated bureaucracy and controls and surveillance that you're put on when you come out of prison to be able to make it back into society that's the peer movement definitely needs to expand to prisoners so daniel this is raising a really important question which is you know what would a different system look like and let's look at all the different 
problems that we can try and eliminate with the current system. And and in your own case, I mean, it sounds like there was this heavy, heavy sentence that came down on you three years, even though you, you were guilty of some degree of the crime that you were convicted of, three years was an excessive, excessive punishment. Is that fair to say? Yes. And so did the appellate division felt that this was an incorrect sentence for a person who was being convicted of a first time a felony. And uh, what had happened is, is which I believe is true, is uh, often people are found guilty and then later or, or sentenced incorrectly and you serve a certain amount of time and the justice doesn't come till after. And so in my case was I was sentenced to three to six years of prison in, in New York State Correction System. And it took my appellate decision to come back three years later that the sentence was did not fit the crime and that as a first-time felon that I should have received something like uh, uh, five years probation. So you never should have gone to jail at all, but of course it, t- it took three years for that to wind its way through the courts, so you ended up spending that time in jail anyway. Yes. Um, and was your psychiatric history, was that part of the conviction, and was there a class element of not being able to afford good enough attorney to represent you properly? Actually, there was the element of the push of trying to get me to um, move towards the capacity to make decisions and that they were wrong and, and to possibly take out a plea around going to a psychiatric institution, and I pushed this away with the attorney because I had had previous experiences in the psychiatric system and knew that I would be forced drugged and, you know, who knows, threatened with shock and long-term institutionalization. So I I certainly chose the plea bargain to go to uh, serve three to six years in the prison system because lawyers often try to use, it's not the insanity defense, but these, these kind of forensic laws that basically at that moment in time, you didn't uh, know what you were doing, so to speak. And I moved away from that because I knew the end result was me- for me was for psychiatry in the mental health system because it hadn't been anything else otherwise that are coercive. So this raises the kind of difficult dilemma that so many people are put into because facing prison time, a lot of people will want to get psychiatric treatment, not realizing the incredible risks and dangers that they're facing um, I know in, in Oregon, we have the um, Psychiatric Security Review Board, which basically a lot of people are just sitting there in the state hospital who've taken an insanity defense, and they are not being let out because they won't take medications. They're considered treatment non-compliant, and they end up being in the hospital for years and years longer than they would have been if they had just been in the general prison uh, population. So this idea that somehow psychiatric treatment is preferable to imprisonment is is very questionable. But I think that there's a way in which some advocates are moving, because they are so concerned about incarceration for good reason, are moving towards wanting to have mental health courts, which basically means that people are diverted into psychiatric treatment. And this is considered a more humane approach, but we have the, the parallel with the drug courts, where people who are arrested for a drug crime are diverted into treatment for addiction, diverted away from spending time in jail, as long as they recognize that they have a drug issue. But this is really, it's not ultimately a solution. It's not really a positive step in a direction because the way in which there's so much discrimination built into it that people may have be making a choice of the lesser of, of two evils, but still they're ending up under court control, they're end- ending up under mandated treatment, they're ending up in a situation where if they, they screw up, they'll go back to jail, rather than, in the case of drugs, saying, look, we need to get this out of the prison the criminal justice system entirely, realize that we have a war on drugs that is, has failed, arresting people for, for marijuana, and then saying you have an addiction, you need to go to jail, which happens in so many different states in the United States, does not make any sense at all. Other drugs are just as dangerous as alcohol, which is a legal drug. That doesn't make any sense either. This is what's driving so much of our prison population. And so the idea has come in, which is that, well, we have these people who are mentally ill, and we're, we've got them in prison without treatment. How do we get them treatment? And that really is a completely wrong-headed way of conceiving the problem. Is that right? Oh, definitely. I think when we look at these systems, I think we need to look at the criminal justice system, the penal system needs to, you know, remain this this system based on law and not become some treatment referral system where it's referring people to particular psychiatric treatments in, in the control of 
of a person as they're being released or the mandates of a person being released in, into the community. And I, I think it's a good opportunity for us to call on the quote-unquote mental health system is that, you know, it needs to really effectively assist people who are struggling, That's you right. know, with different That's issues, people who are, you know, labeled as distraught, who are in crisis, and who are really seeking uh, support and help to deal with emotional issues. Mm-hmm. And, and those be in a self-determined and, and self-defined way for, for that person. And when we mix those two systems that have legal components in them, and we use those as the only alternative to the other, I, I think we're in, in deep trouble as a, a society. And I think there's more communal ways in, in looking deeply at the practice of, of restorative justice. Um, and then also well as um, our comrades in the disability movement and looking at what the um, social model of, of disability is and, and what the correlation and opportunity could be with restorative justice. Absolutely. I mean, there needs to be a community response to these problems. And when deinstitutionalization happened, there was a promise, which was that we're going to have community services in the community available to people on a voluntary basis. They're humane. They're going to connect with people who have problems, and they're going to help people avoid um, the need for greater institutional involvement. And the funding just has not come through on that. And then people fall through the cracks, and they end up mostly on very petty kinds of crimes like trespassing or causing some kind of disturbance in public or people are worried about them or they're acting weird and then now you only have the police that can be involved and now the person is involved in the criminal justice system cops will pick people up on the assumption that well we're getting this person into the hospital we're getting them into treatment they feel like they're doing something humanitarian by pulling them in to the uh, the system but the system just isn't there in terms of community supports and and really a peer-led solution and community-controlled solutions that are based on self-determination. Everything is moving in the direction of public safety and coercion, and really the criminal justice system has itself, in a way, become the paradigm for mental health care in the community. For certain, and I think one of the biggest things that we have to really take a look at, even as a movement, you know, the consumer survivor expatient movement, Mm -hmm. and, and how we can uphold people's autonomy and, and, and their human rights as, as what they want when they're transitioning um, out of these institutions into the community. Um, but, you know, we have to really look at the social concerns, housing and employment opportunities, and just, you know, the, the real grassroots experiences that, that people are in poverty. And That's right. That's like right. you had mentioned, you know, some of the things that people get locked up for is just a sad thing that is taking place. And, and I, I want to, kick back to one thing is I wanted us to understand something about the sentencing around one important factor for me to take the sentence I didn't originally was is that I knew that I had a ending sentence with psychiatry and mental health I never had an ending sentence when I was and I think having a determined sentence was an easy decision for me with mental health courts I think one of the biggest issues and I've been trying to work really close with abolition groups and reformist prison groups is please be careful when we're calling for such things because it's almost like this double jeopardy. So if you enter the mental health court, but you fail, meaning that you don't comply, you don't stay on the treatment regimen. Which might mean not taking your medications. It might also mean just skipping appointments with your doctor or not making it to your caseworker on time enough. It's a complete control paradigm. And you'll come back to the, you'll possibly face in some of these mental health courts, because none of them are the same, that you would be faced with the original charge that you were charged with. I really don't see that as a real community, a holistic alternative to either one of the systems. And there's no end date to the treatment. I mean, like I was saying, there's people in the state hospital who are, have been there many, many more years than if they had just stayed in the prison system. They go into the psychiatric insanity defense system and there's the end date is just when doctors decide you have much, much less in the way of rights to defend yourself and stand up when it's considered a medical issue and you don't have any kind of insight or you're just struggling with a disease that you're not willing to get treatment for because you're resisting medications or you're not cooperating on that level. So you mentioned, Daniel, the, the restorative justice movement. I think this is really a paradigm for community response to community problems. That's really the direction that we need to go. And I know that you're doing a lot of great work there in Queensbury, New York, with your Voices of the Heart and the peer movement there. And let's talk a little bit about what kind of direction we'd like to see the uh, society go in. 
one of many nice things about working in a small community is um, the beginning of you know these these uh, cross collaboration of of issues and you know we've really been pushing the idea of a collective community coming together and talking about these issues that take place from a person experiencing madness to a person who uh, commits crimes and my hope here in our just our small community is that that we can have some effect with the local elected officials, politicians, and the mental health system, and we are, you know, we have a relationship with the um, police department here. And you know, my hope is an example is here we are. We have a respite house, and the person's being picked up by the police, or a person's been called on by uh, a neighbor for either suspicious activity or maybe experiencing something that people call bizarre behavior. But to look at our organization, our community, as a resource so that the person has the opportunity to experience not being put in the jail cell, not being put in a psychiatric ward, and having the opportunity to come to a communal setting um, where they can work through what they feel uh, they need to work through. So, And do the local police there know that the respite is available? and that they Are they starting to use that as an option more and more? We've had more actual people call us directly, diverting, knowing that they have what we call pickup orders here. We've had deep conversations uh, with the police force, and they're, they're telling us that they have um, direct laws that oh, precipitate what they can do and what they can't do. So we have to look at things on a policy yeah. level. But my answer to them is, well, let's look at a, a domestic dispute between uh, partnerships or, or family members and how... Uh, we see domestic abuse, so to speak, respite houses available for people and houses. And to look at us in the same capacity as that. So I, I think we are making some progress. I think it's going to take time. I'm not a very patient person. Well, I, but think, I think you guys are really at the leading edge with this. And, and I think that that analogy to the domestic uh, violence movement is a really good analogy because we don't tend to medicalize that situation we don't when a man a husband a boyfriend is beating his wife or girlfriend which is really the that's basically the scenario that we're facing i mean there are exceptions to that there are same same sex partnerships and there are other kinds of situations that people get into but that's really what we're talking about is male violence towards women that isn't seen as a symptom of the man's disease that's seen as a criminal issue and it's seen as something that's not left to the medical system to deal with. And so women who are in that situation get a different kinds of response. There often are peers. Often there are women domestic violence workers who will meet with the woman, who will be involved with the situation, who will talk the situation. They'll play the role of helper and connecting them with the resources without medicalizing the woman, without saying, oh, you've got masochistic disorder or you're part of this symptom of a disease, this thing that you're going through. Although, of course, there is that psychiatric diagnosis that does start to creep in but fundamentally we don't really see domestic violence as a medical issue and we provide a response that does include safe houses includes rape crisis centers and includes all this sort of social fabric that came out of the women's movement and the activism around rape and rape crisis centers and the development of that in the 70s and i think it's a really important analogy that you're making because maybe we need to start doing that around mental health issues we definitely do, and, and I, I do want to give you an example of a, the relationship we've built with. We, we have, um, in New York State, we have county directors, and uh, mm -hmm. our county director has called me in numerous times, and, and in the paper that Tina uh, Minkowitz and I uh, co-wrote, we talk about, I give a brief scenario of when the county director called me and said, listen, there's a person who basically is loitering on his family's back porch, camped out, won't leave, they're going to have him arrested. Can you, Voices of the Heart, go reach out to this person and see if they're interested in connecting with you and the resources you have to to dissolve this, what they called it, was a conflict. It worked. What did you and guys do? Two of us went over and basically walked up to the back porch and uh, shared who we were and shared that uh, with all honesty and, and, and all intention that, you know, the, the family had called the county and we're going to have... Uh, him picked up by the um, police department. We didn't know what the result would be from the police picking him up. We shared the two worst scenarios that we're pretty much aware of was the hospital or the psychiatric ward, and and could we offer an alternative, and that would be to camp out 
on our porch, which we do have a back porch <laughs> at our Respa house. That's great. And, and you know, just meeting the person where they were. Maybe they just wanted to be camped out. I, I, I don't know. The person didn't end up camping out. They actually came into one of the rooms at the Respa house, but <laughs> it worked. That's and a, I think community's a- responsibility in this is to look at, you know, the value of why we have community and neighbors and neighborhoods and, and to go deeper into a kind of a communal support instead of the systems being always the answer or the enforcers always being the answers uh, to respond to these things. I think that's absolutely right. And that's what a beautiful, a beautiful example. I mean, it's just such a simple thing in a sense. You just go up to someone and say, hey, can we, you know, the police might be on the way if you don't kind of deal with this and let's look at some options here and can you come and stay with us or can we find you a different place to be and um, it sounds very simple and very common sense and it is except that we have this law and order mentality where there are no resources like voices of the heart the first thing that someone's going to do is call the police when their family conflict escalates and then that can i mean that person may have been taken off of a track that could have led to a lifetime of institutionalization could have led to assault could have led to psychiatric abuse, forced hospitalization. The person could have just snowballed into greater and greater dependency on the system. Now, how expensive is that going to be in the long term when we turn people who are having strange and unusual states who get into conflicts in the community, when they t- we turn them into chronic mental patients? We have models. It's working. Voices of the Heart is giving us incredible innovations. There are other innovations around the country. The pure respite alternative is something I think there are five or six around the country. There are people who are trying to get more of these available to people. There are peer-run organizations in every state, and we are trying to get more resources into these organizations. There are solutions out there. If we can get away from this fear response, if we can get away from the focus on institutional response and the profiteering that happens, the way in which the criminal justice system is looking for people to put in the prisons, that that has become a source of profit, there are alternative, there are new directions that we can go in, but I think that unfortunately the society is often so gripped in fear and this law and order mentality that even getting the prison system on the political map of discussion, I mean, it's not included in presidential debates, it's not included in electoral struggles in terms of mainstream candidates, because I think candidates know if they start talking about getting people out of prisons or ending the war on drugs, there's so much of a fear response and there's so many entrenched interests that they cannot even put it on the table. But hopefully the work that you're doing and the work that the grassroots is doing, we can start to change that because the present, the present approach of meeting community problems with institutional solutions is just too, it's too expensive and it, it hurts too many people and doesn't accomplish the goals of mental health or public safety at all. I agree. And it's a, you know, it's an economic moneymaker and people are um, using human beings as a commodity. And I agree with you. And I, I think there's this call for all of us and as a community that we have responsibility and we offer support in very different uh, ways and I think actually our our movement, the consumer survivor ex patient movement, is the igniter in this in you know this peer support um, and the practice of it, this lived experience, and then being able to connect with people and and what that takes to do that. It came, I think, originally from AA, which is working with addictions right. that we can have peer support, and now it's been picked up around mental health in general, and I think it. it has direct relevance to questions of criminal justice and working with felons and working with people who committed crimes. And Daniel, one of the things that I've been concerned about and and talking with people and writing about is that the way in which we tend to silo and segregate our issues, that those of us who are working on mental health issues tend to get more focused on medications or psychiatric rights in institutions, and we don't take the broader picture into account. What do you think about the movement embracing prison abolition and alternatives to prisons and embracing poverty and racism issues. I really think that this is the direction that we need to go to start connecting these issues. Now, I'm very inspired to hear that you were invited to the Occupy Oakland event at, at San Quentin. And what do you think about the future of our movement putting these putting these issues together and no longer separating them the way that we've done in the past? I think we're experiencing it in, in small pockets of our I guess our movement and, and country. And so I am excited. I agree 100%. We, we should be doing this. And I think when we look at 
a civil rights movement and a human rights movement, we have to look broader than the things that we've been just focused on for so many years. And I think the timing's right. I think um, in this country with the activism and, and the advocacy that we're seeing take place with, with the different occupies, I think our movement has an opportunity to learn a lot from other movements as well, and especially the cross-collaboration piece. As much as we can offer, we can learn from those other struggles. And I, I think one thing that's really been beautiful experience for me to work with, which I am a part of, is the, you know this prison abolition movement. I, uh, my first experience was presenting at Critical Resistance Conference, Critical Resistance 10 in Oakland, I think it was 2006. It was just an unbelievable experience to see abolitionists and re prison reformists come together because they don't always agree. And I kind of e equate this to sometimes the struggles that the consumer movement and the survivor expatient uh, movement kind of struggle with these internal fractions at times. And it's not to be negative. It's, it's to be the reality of mm -hmm. any grass struggle is we have this and how powerful it was to say, all right, let's, let's, let's work towards the common goal that we believe that people's rights should not, human rights should not be violated and uh, it was just an amazing experience to see them come together and, you know, strategize and, and speak and teach and share. And um, I would really like to see us do that, uh, be more strategic in the consumer survivor ex patient movement. But I'd like to really see us, which uh, I think you and I have talked briefly a few times about, and which I am working on, is bringing the prison abolition reform groups with together with consumer survivor ex patients group in a working conference to move forward uh, particular issues, and that's been a deeper discussion since I left Occupy San Quentin uh, with the with the Occupy Oakland people. I see really good things on the horizon um, in our movement. Um, I think I see that all over the United States, the excitement and energy of crossing what we call silos, cross-collaborating on uh, these issues that are actually so much related. I just don't think we've taken the time to, to share and build and educate on. I think it's so important, Daniel. And that, that phrase, ab abolition and abolishing prisons, that's something that's often controversial. We don't have a lot of time left in the interview, but can you speak to that? I mean, my own position is that morally, there's prison system is, in, is indefensible. It's just too much, and it's too extreme. And maybe, yes, we need to separate people sometimes. We need to create safety, but having this institutional aspect of our society where so many prisoners are just kept and locked up long term with this the racist discrimination and having more prisoners in this country than any other country in the world i think it's one out of a hundred adults in the country is is incarcerated there's no moral defense for that what what do you what do you think about this idea of abolition and the criticism that people might say well, it's not a realistic goal of abolishing prisons. Well, when I wear my critical resistance shirt, sweatshirt, and it says that on the back, I get a lot of comments from people in the grocery line. Do you really believe that? <laughs> and I think I, I really do believe that. Maybe because I've experienced that oppression from inside the walls and understanding uh, exactly how that industry works. I also have, I, I feel the same way about abolition of psychiatric institutions as well. Uh, so that's that. So that's noted, and people see it as this very radical view and vision, and and how can you think this way of people who are rapists or murderers, even as a survivor of sexual abuse, you know, sexual abuse persons who have uh, done that. Honestly, deep in my heart, from my experience, more so than an eloquent way to recommend things, is is that it can happen. There has to be ways to practice new things to move away from. Just warehousing people for economic reasons or slavery and discriminatory reasons. And this goes both for the, the penal prison system and the psychiatric mm -hmm. system. And personally, it just comes from inside of me, Will, more and more as a free man today and why I fight with, I mean, even my family has said to me, you really believe this? And I really do in the vision that community can be responsible. I don't think we would experience some of the things that we experience, those horrific things I mentioned, if community felt a different way about the person, you know, residing next door to them or people who are gentrified into different communities, I just think the oppression is, is so strong and so built and there's these stereotypes and discrimination that it blocks it. But I, I do think 
that we can break down those walls and offer people a different way and different choices before we even get to that way, I think is, is the biggest answer. I don't think it's anytime soon in my lifetime, I'll admit that, but I have to as a former prisoner, you know, right. a survivor of psychiatry that, that I do that. Daniel, we're just about out of time. Can you give us contact information? People want to find out more about uh, Voices of the Heart and get in touch with you. Sure. Here at Voice of the Heart, you can check us out at, of course, www.voicesoftheheart.net. And that's all of our information and resources. I also, as Will mentioned earlier, you can also see some of these prison resources that I work alongside with Tina Minkowitz to promote these and, and, and have dialogue and discussion around these documents and presentations is uh, www.ch. R-U-S-P.org. Daniel Hazen, thank you for joining us today on Madness Radio. Thank you. You've been listening to an interview with Daniel Hazen. He's a psychiatric survivor and also a survivor of imprisonment. Daniel is the executive director of the peer-run agency Voices of the Heart in Queensbury, New York, and he's a founding board member of the Center for Human Rights of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio is co-sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Hosted by Will Hall. Music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lansman. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network, including KBOO in Oregon, WXOJ and WBCR in Massachusetts, Alaska's KWMD, and WPRR in Michigan. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, to help get us broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.